For the better part of 15 years, the biggest mining prize in a generation or more has confounded those who would develop it. One of the key issues is how to get to and from the remote area. That problem got closer to a solution when the province recently announced agreement on the terms of reference for a First Nations-led plan for a permanent road to the Ring of Fire. With us now on the significance of this deal, let's welcome geoscientist Kristen Straub, CEO of Ring of Fire Metals. That's a Canadian mining subsidiary of Australia's Wailu Metals. He's also a member of Henvey Inlet First Nation. Virginia Heffernan is here, principal of GeoPen Communications, whose new book is Ring of Fire, High Stakes Mining in a Lowlands Wilderness. And Stan Sudol, communication consultant, mining strategist who runs the website The Republic of Mining. And it's great to have you three here with us at TVO tonight for a subject that we have returned to numerous times as the yardsticks have got moved down the field ever so slowly, eh, Stan? Yes. Ever so slowly. Very so. Okay, let's start with a map of the proposed road. Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind, let's bring this up, and I'll, for those listening on podcast, we'll just describe a little bit of what we are seeing. There is in red, up at the top, the very rich mineral deposit discovered in 2007, none of it mined yet. We see where the proposed road is, and then the communities of Martin Falls and Webequi are in agreement about the assessment for the road, Nescantaga not. Also, the communities of Attawapiskat and Fort Albany on the shores of James Bay in the region, not. The Ring of Fire, incidentally, more than 500 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. It's up there. Now, let's talk about the possibility of that road. Uh, Kristen, start us off. When would you like to see this road completed, within reason, so that the Ring of Fire metals, your company, can start the mining process? Well, Steve, I think that's a great question because, uh, you know, for Ring of Fire Metals, the Eagle's Nest operation is contingent upon this road, of course. Uh, Eagle's Nest Eagle's is? Eagle's Nest is the deposit. Mm -hmm. So the red area that you outlined for the Ring of Fire is what appears to be a claim map for the claims, the mineral claims that are held by Ring of Fire Metals in that area. And on one of those claims is where the Eagle's Nest uh, Nickel Copper PG deposit is located. And that's the deposit that we're looking to... Um, conduct the environmental assessment on, go through permitting, and ultimately build construction through. And that would require the road. So as, as you may be well aware, in the last few weeks, the government has announced that they have reached a, an agreement with the proponents for the environmental assessment, which are Webequay and uh, Martin Falls, yep. for one particular section of the roads. So we're obviously, area. in terms of timelines, talking multiple, multiple years here. That's but correct. But in terms of a shovel in the ground to actually build the road, when do you think that could happen? That's not going to happen until the environmental assessments are complete and the permitting aspects are complete through that. And the proponents being the First Nations are, are really in the driver's seat for the time that that, that will take and the consultation process that that will go through. Gotcha. Virginia, talk to us about the road building, uh, geologically speaking, because uh, we probably need to know more about the kind of land this road would be built on and whether it's conducive, actually, to having a road built on it. What do you think? <clears throat> well, James Bay Lowlands is... As, as you know, is very swampy. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to find a little high ground to build the road on. Um, and it just so happens that the glaciers, when they moved off 10,000 years ago, left behind a ridge of gravel and sand uh, that would be considered the high ground. And so I think that it's got to go through the environmental process first, the environmental assessment process, and they're still trying to figure out the route but I think that that esker will be, uh, prob it's probably the most practical way to, to, to build the road. So bottom line, this north-south route mm -hmm. is doable in your view? Yes, I believe so. You believe so? That's not the, you know, the most strong endorsement I've ever heard on this program. I'm not a, I'm not a geotechnical te engineer, so... But you believe so? I believe so. Okay. How much closer do you think the developments of the past several weeks, Stan, have uh, taken us to having this thing actually become reality? Uh, it's, it's a slow walk, but, but you have to remember that, um, as, as Virginia said, the Eskers are a great place to, to build the road. And, and we have to remember historically, uh, on the peatlands themselves, in the 1930s, we built a railroad to Moosonee and we built a railroad to Churchill, Manitoba, uh, and it had no discernible effects uh, on the entire Hudson Bay lowlands. So actually having that Esker is a real gift from the geological gods, if you want to look at it, because you've got a higher ground. 
the vast majority of the route will be on the esker, so the impact on the peatlands is going to be very low. And what little sections of peatlands that the uh, road has to go through, uh, the way they construct the road is just going to be directly with some kind of a, a high-tech padding, so the impact on the peatlands is going to be minimized to the uh, to a very high degree. So. The concerns of environmentalists about uh, detrimental impact to the entire um, uh, peatlands is well, well overblown. I, I must confess, esker is a new word to me that I've just learned, this naturally okay. occurring ridge. How do you spell it? Uh, I guess it's E-S-K-E-R. Is that yes, right? that's correct. Yeah. Esker, yes. okay, Thank good. You. <laughs> well, we like to be the nation's <laughs> education station, so there we go. Um, okay, what the world needs now is nickel. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to that map again, Sheldon, if we can. And we have mm -hmm. marked the deposit. Uh, in mining circles, they've called it the eagle's nest, as we heard. Now, geologically speaking, that nickel vein, you want to tell us where that is exactly on this map here? Kristen, you want to tell us? So, on the map you have uh, the identification where eagle's nest is that's sort of in the central area of the ring of fire. And the eagle's nest deposit is a nickel copper PG sulfide based deposit. It's it's not unlike a nickel copper sulfide based deposit that you'd find in Sudbury. It's composed of massive sulfide, uh, which is very high grade in, in terms of the, the amount of nickel in it. And then there are greater amounts of, uh, to a lesser degree of sulfide minerals that are in the host rocks, which we would also look to mine at that point in time. And then through that, through our mining activities, we would then process it in a conventional uh, mill through a flotation circuit and produce a concentrate. How far away would the mill be? The mill would actually be on the site for okay. Eagle's Nest, and that's one of the unique things about the Eagle's Nest operation is we've worked with our, you know, with some some very creative engineers that have worked to design a very minimal footprint on that particular operation and that design. So we would minimize the amount of surface disturbance that would be in the area. We would prioritize the development in the area of existing disturbance. And to make reference back to Esker, the current camp that sits there for the exploration activities is called the Esker Camp because it sits atop of, of one of these Eskers. So you're in an area where it is, uh, it is very high ground. Uh, we would, of course, have to access through the Esker down to, to get underground and, and begin mining. So all of the infrastructure that's required to support the operation would be contained within this footprint, which is roughly about 30% of one square, square kilometer in, in the area. Mm -hmm. There'd be very minimal impact on the mine site itself for the physiographic region around in terms of impacts on wetlands or peatlands. To get that nickel, Virginia, how deep will they have to drill and mine? Well, <clears throat> I, think, I think you've established it's, it's about 1.8 kilometers at this point, but that's, that's as much as you've drilled. Maybe. Yeah, we've, we've drilled down into the about 1.6 kilometers, but 1. you're not far 6. off in, okay. in there. So. Yeah. And, and, and what's known today, Steve, is, is, is really it's divided into three different categories, measured, indicated, and inferred. And the inferred is probably the lower half of the deposit. So today we don't have any economic plans around that because we don't have the quality and the quantity of geological information to make an economic assessment on it. But in the upper half, we do have the quantity and the quality of geological information to be able to make that decision. So, and, and that's really what the basis of the last feasibility study was completed in 2012. And Virginia, if, if you've got to go 1.6, 1.8, two kilometers down to get the nickel that's there, uh, again, for those of us who don't know that much about mining, how typical is that in terms of the depths to which you have to go to find what you're looking for? And that's relatively deep, but there are mines that are deeper, and, and uh, you know, the, the actual mine itself is ra rather straightforward. You, you, you put, put down a, sh a shaft, and, and you probably would have a some kind of a ramp going going down around the shaft to bring the materials in uh, by truck or ever, however you're going to to manage that. So does it go without saying, Stan, that if you've got to go, if it's relatively deep, deeper than average, this is a more expensive proposition than typical. Is that fair to say? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, underground mines are uh, more expensive than open pit mines. Um, one of the most wonderful parts of this whole project is that there's not going to be any tailing facilities on surface. One of the plan, one of their really great green plans, great green plans, is uh, basically they're going to be putting their tailings underground. The Hudson Bay lowlands um, are vast, from Churchill, Manitoba, to a little section uh, around uh, Quebec's uh, James Bay, and it's almost as large as the country of Norway. 
Hmm. So when you're talking about one third of a square kilometer, that quite literally is like a less than a pinprick on the backside of an elephant. So the impact is absolutely minimum. And uh, you're digging up the material that we desperately need to uh, decarbonize um, um, the transportation sector. I'm going to follow up on that in a second, but I just want to get Virginia on this. Uh, we, there's copper, there's gold, there's chromium, there's nickel. Are you making the argument that the nickel is what should be gone after first, and if so, why? Well, that just makes sense. I mean, it's, it's the most uh, drilled off deposit. Um, so there's been exploration going on there since 2007. Uh, uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an established deposit. The other ones would be at an, an earlier stage of exploration. And also because it's a high grade nickel deposit. That's what I want. This so is, it's, yeah, it's high this quality is, this nickel. This is a high grade nickel deposit and, and this is what we need. Um, Doug Ford's grand plan to have EV battery manufacturing in Ontario uh, requires that we have critical minerals, especially nickel. There is an argument to be made that if we're going to fulfill our potential as it relates to getting electric vehicles on the road, we need the minerals that are going to be required to make that happen and the minerals for that are there. So that, are you making the argument that every day we delay getting that stuff out of the ground is a day that we are delaying having our highways be more pollution free. Uh, that absolutely can be said. I mean, just today, the uh, International um, Climate Change Committee has come out with a report that they want to fast forward 2050 to 2040 uh, because we are in a climate change emergency. So the longer we delay on building the road and starting construction of the mines, uh, the more problematic it gets. Uh, and, and remember, um, we're seeing this entire transition f uh, of the uh, uh, um, internal combustion engine to the electric vehicle engine market. Um, and we, right now, uh, and, and just some context, before, um, uh, before COVID, we, the world produced roughly 100 million cars, give or take. Now think about 100 million cars has to have to be converted to electric vehicles uh, and, and that's the plan. And right now, we don't have enough nickel to do that. We don't even have enough nickel to, to do half of that or even a quarter of that. So the sooner we get more uh, nickel coming on stream, especially from jurisdictions, uh, world-class jurisdictions like Ontario that have rules and regulations, uh, the better it is for climate change emergency. Well, this is what I want to put to Kristen, because you, obviously there are going to be people watching us and listening to us right now who are going to say, <laughs> You know, how can mining, which, which can be done, which can be done, let me put it this way, which certainly is done today better than it was done 50 years ago in terms of the impact it has on, on the climate and the environment and so on. How can, how can mining be a good thing to do, even if the idea is to get to more EVs on the road at the end of the day? Can you t speak to that? It's a, it's a great question, Steve. I can start with not all nickels created equally and not all nickel comes from the same types of deposits. For the Eagle's Nest deposit, which I might add starts at surface and goes down to 1.2 kilometers down to depth and, and, and the bottom is not known yet, but it is a, a sulfide hosted deposit. What does that mean? That means that the nickel and the copper are tied up with sulfur metals, uh, sulfur minerals in, in terms of minerals. And as we extract the rock, then we want to concentrate those sulfur minerals to be able to process the nickel that comes, uh, to process the material that comes out of it to extract the nickel and copper. That's not new. The other type of deposits are nickel deposits that are hosted in, in silicates or laterites or uh, oxide type deposits. Those deposits, while they have a, a tremendous amount of nickel, are typically hosted around the circumequatorial region. So think of Indonesia, think of places like New Caledonia that both Inku and Falkenbridge 20 years ago invested in plants in. This is halfway around the world. Exactly, halfway around the world. But they are very energy intensive processes to extract the nickel out of it. For instance, in Indonesia, it's about six times the energy to extract a unit of nickel out of a uh, nickel pig iron plant um, to be able to create class one nickel that would then go into a battery that would be used for a battery electric vehicle. And again, remember the context of this is around creating environmentally sustainably sourced nickel in through here. But this is the point I wanna, uh, I'd like you to speak to, which is, are the gains we will make through electric vehicles on the roads, therefore polluting less, worth the damage, let's call it damage, the damage that will be done by mining in that area? 
Well, they certainly can be in North America, and particularly in Ontario, where better than 90% of our electricity is non-carbon sourced into here. Quebec is, is, is uniquely positioned as well, because the majority of their hydro comes from hydro comes from hydroelectricity. James Bay. Exactly, in that. So we're uniquely positioned with the Eagle's Nest deposit to participate in that market if we have a favorable environment to be able to construct and permit new mines. Could you put a dollar guess on what's there? Excellent question. I think, you know, there's been some media around uh, asking questions. There's been some very, very, fairly lofty numbers that have been proposed out through there. And if I can provide some context around that, you know, in, in the work that we've done on the, nic the nickel copper PG deposit of Eagle's Nest, in along with the, chromite, the known chromite deposits that we have, in as well with the copper zinc deposits that we have, you know, we've established a gross metal value. So the in situ value of the minerals in the rock of about 90 billion dollars. Nine in zero billion. Nine zero, yes, that's correct. You've heard other numbers that are out there that have approached a trillion. Now, mm -hmm. Canada should be well aware and well familiar with that because we're one of the leading countries and jurisdictions where exploration dollars are put forward and proposed on the TSX. So companies raise money on the potential value on exploration plays. And I don't think it's out of line for anyone to put an estimate that's that large on there if they're considering what the exploration value and the upside could mm. be in a district like that. It's very early days in terms of discovery. As Virginia pointed out, the discovery was made in 2007. If you were to look at some of the other camps, the mining camps in Canada that have been ongoing for better than 100, 140 years out there, the value certainly is in that similar range. And Stan, can I get you just to circle back to the point that you made a second ago, which was to say, and Kristen just made the point, that a lot of this kind of mining is going on half, half the way around the world, where the labor standards may not be so good, where the oversight may not be so good, where the regulations may not be so good. Would you make an ethical argument that it's better that it happens here. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> you have to understand, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines are the first and second largest nickel producers in the world. It's all coming from the laterites. Uh, it, they're open pit mines, and they're located in biodiverse, rich, tropical rainforests. Like, I know the environmental movement uh, does talk about the Hudson Bay lowlands as being a carbon sink. Well, everything that grows is a carbon sink, and yes, there's a fair amount of carbon that's uh, captured in the Hudson Bay lowland, but by any stretch, the carbon, di uh, the, um, the biodiversity of the Hudson Bay lowlands, uh, other than a billion different varieties of mosquitoes and deer fly, are nothing close to what you have in the tropical rainforest of Indonesia and the Philippines. And you also, they're also smaller regions. These are very overpopulated countries. So there's a lot of competition for what little land there is. So you have strip mining, uh, done predominantly by Chinese companies. Um, I suspect that the restoration policies are not at the same standards as they would be in Ontario. Uh, on top of it, um, using coal-fired power, so your carbon uh, rates are going through the roof while Ontario uh, electricity is much cleaner. How about labor standards? Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, rule of law in both these countries would not be the same as it would be here in Ontario. I keep on reading reports uh, in international media how people are being forced off their farmlands because they want to uh, enlarge these um, uh, open pit mines and the kicker is that the tailings are basically pumped into the ocean and these islands are surrounded by fragile coral reefs so you're you're it's 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 almost a crime against nature because of the biodiversity of those uh, tropical regions versus the Hudson Bay lowlands which takes us to Virginia are you satisfied that the mining can be done in the ring of fire in a way that respects the environment and is as environmentally sensitive as possible Yes, I, I, I want to pick up, pick up on something that both Stan and Kristen said. I think people have this concept of the Ring of Fire being this, like the oil sands. And, and actually, way back when the discovery was made, this was, this was something that was being promoted. This is like the oil sands. This is great. We, you know, we can make lots of money on this. But it's not like that at all. Uh, as Kristen pointed out, it's, it's this, this de Eagle's Nest deposit that we're talking about uh, that starts at surface. It's quite narrow. It goes straight down. Um, and the footprint is, is minimal. Um, it, there's, there can be no comparison to the oil sands. We're not talking about open pits here. We're talking about a very contained mining operation. Gotcha. 
Uh, let's play some tape right now. Actually, we don't play tape on this program anymore. It's all digital, so I don't know why I keep saying that. But anyway, J.P. Gledoux has been a guest on this program mm -hmm. before. He's an Anishinaabe and principal at Mokwate Limited. It's a consultancy that's bringing indigenous communities and the business sector together. And we uh, talked with him about, uh, well, about all of this and one thing in particular, which is what we're going to hit on next. Sheldon, the clip, if you would. We're not a monolith. Our communities have different socioeconomic backgrounds and aspirations, and we don't all get along all the time. We're just like any culture. We'll have the 20% for, 20% against, and the, and the percentage in the middle that are, are trying to figure out which side they, they sit on. I mean, we're you, typically what's happening these days is uh, um, we're required for 100% consensus. A couple of familiar faces, I think, uh, here today in that discussion as well. Look, he's talking about the fact that there seems to be a requirement to get 100% consensus. Uh, and as you heard him say at the end, it's unreasonable to expect a standard of 100% consensus of all the First Nations in the area to be on board for this. I note that in most democracies, you need 50% plus one, except, of course, on Toronto City Council, where apparently you only need a third of the votes sometimes to win a, a vote with the strong mayor system. To what extent... Kristen, to you first. To what extent is the 100% requirement unreasonable in your view? I think it's, a, it's an absolutely unreasonable expectation to have anybody at 100%. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's always a contrarian voice that will be out there. And when I say always, that, that's an, almost an, abs that is an absolute at that point in time. But it's very easy to find someone that would take a contrarian approach. I think in the process that we go through for developing consent, has to be in favor of having the most meaningful outcomes and the largest benefit across for the group that's out there. So what's reason if 100% is not reasonable, what's what percentage of buy-in would you say is reasonable to make it go forward? But we work and live in a democracy today. So I think the democratic principles and the democratic processes that we have are the same processes that we should be using through here. And that's the part and the, and the approach that you know, our business and our company has taken into in, in this process is by working with the parties who are today on side and at least aligned and favorable in terms of the proponency for the road. We continue to work with them. For those that aren't, you know, we reach back out. We would ideally love to have consensus across all of the communities out there and extend the discussion to those communities to be able to enter into that, that discussion, to be able to get the road built as well as get the operation and the mine built. Virginia, what do you think is reasonable here? I think majority rules. 50% plus one. Yeah. So if 50% of the First Nations plus one are on side, then the whole thing should be Well, I don't, I don't know if you can really put it in those terms because... Uh, we're, we're not talking about you know, citizens, we're talking about communities, and each community has to make their own decision. Um, but yeah, I would say if the majority of the communities are on side, that seems like a reasonable bar. Stan? Um, obviously, the two closest communities who's on whose traditional territory um, uh, the, the most of the route into the Ring of Fire and the majority of the deposits are on, are on side, and that's Webbequay and Martin Falls. Um, uh, Niskanik and Attawapiskat obviously are, are often in the news uh, opposing it. And we have to remember that Attawapiskat had a diamond mine uh, 70 kilometers away from them uh, for 12 years, and there was no problem with that. Uh, now this is, uh, and that was an open pit mine. Uh, and now this is a mine that's 270 kilometers away from the community, underground, very low impact, and they seem to be having a huge issue. Why? I don't really know. Well, part of it is there's the feeling that, well, if there's a problem, um, uh, if something happens, in a, uh, the, uh, it will fall into the Attawapiskat River and flow into our community. But the same argument could have been said with the diamond mine, and they had no problem with that. And by the way, Webbequay and Martin Falls never complained and never opposed the diamond mine when that was going into development, and yet they're not getting the same favor in return. Um, and, and, but all that being said, uh, I think there's a role for both the federal and provincial government uh, to go to all the media communities, and that's obviously Webbequay, uh, Martin Falls, Niskandika, Attawapiskat, and Arrowland, where the road will uh, be starting for them, and basically do some sort of an indigenous marshal plan for infrastructure. So when you go into these communities now, not give, give these communities promises later, but go in now, deal with health, education, 
um, social services, uh, housing. Uh, let's let's show these communities that there are going to be enormous benefits, but here's a down payment well, on some of those benefits. Let me follow up on that. You've no doubt made the argument to these communities that are opposing right now mm -hmm. that this will be good for you, and here's why. What's the here's why? Well, the here's why is just in, in terms of uh, benefits back to the communities. You know, what we've discussed with the communities is creating meaningful partnerships for training, employment, and development. Remember, these are very small communities today that there is limited opportunity for employment within the community. Mm -hmm. Most community members have to leave. The other thing that we've made is a commitment of $100 million in contracting to Indigenous-led and Indigenous-owned businesses that are, is in there. So that's another you know, strong point from a, a development perspective to empower First Nations to develop the businesses that will participate, not only at the mine, but in, in terms of the development of the road, the construction of the road, the maintenance of the road, the infrastructure that goes in as well. And that's not something that's just simply restricted to only the first two communities that are immediately adjacent to us, Webaquay and Martin Falls. That's the communities within the region that we're looking to establish that with. Do you think they are holding out simply for a better financial package? A good question. Um, you know, those who are engaged in the process today are actually engaged in part of that discussion. Now, we have memorandums of understanding with uh, both Martin Falls and Webaquay, Webaquay which we most recently signed uh, last year, but the other communities I believe that they're outstanding today in terms of in terms of the engagement just looking to understand how is it that we participate what does it look like and how do we enable that because they're faced with a balance today as Stan pointed out in terms of the the challenges that they face from a federal and a provincial and we've heard those comments back in the news and in the media of saying you know we're not going to create this development here today because we have a whole bunch of other things to to answer to be it water quality be it education be it housing like there is a tremendous amount of pressures that are on communities mm. but I guess the I'm one trying thing to figure out how, how firm their no is is there is there no an absolute firm no and there's nothing you can say to turn them around or if you maybe sweeten the package a bit could you get them to yes I think that's a great question and you'd have to ask them how firm their no is but through our interactions we believe that through the consultative process that we can ultimately reach an agreement with the First Nations for the development Okay, Virginia, I want you to look into your crystal ball because there's a section of the book that we referenced that, uh, off the top that you wrote where you describe what the future could look like if we get this right, both financially, economically, environmentally, etc. Paint the picture. What does it look right. like? Okay, well, economically, I think we can provide a lot of jobs um, up in the north, which has always been a, an issue. Um, uh, Indigenous-led businesses, uh, catering, trucking, you name it, could be providing the services to these mines. Um, I think that revenue sharing is important. I, I think that's a model that we haven't really looked at, but um, if, if we want these communities to, 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 to share in the prosperity and be able to support uh, schools and health care and uh, good housing, uh, this, this is important that they have revenue coming into their communities. Um, and, and, and also self-governance. Uh, this is something that has, has not been discussed, but it's happening in other parts of Canada. And, mm -hmm. and it would certainly help those communities if they, if they were able to make their own decisions about how their future looks. Can I follow up with you on the issue of your company being a Canadian subsidiary of an Australian company? What do the Aussies know about this uh, that you think would be useful uh, for the particular circumstances we find ourselves in now? Certainly, that's a great question. If you, if you look at the structure of, of, of ownership around uh, Ring of Fire Metals, ultimately that ownership leads up to uh, a gentleman and his family, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Andrew Forrest and his family. Now, Do Dr. Forrest created Fortescue Minerals Group, which is the world's fourth largest iron ore producer today. Uh, and in the development and the, the implementation for production on those iron ore mines, Dr. Fortescue committed to making meaningful partnership with Indigenous or Aboriginal groups in Australia, creating Aboriginal businesses, and made some pledges out of that. Now, what we see today is that with Fortescue Metals, group. They are the second largest indigenous employer in Australia, second only to the government agencies in through there. Dr. Forrest had made a commitment, what was called a billion dollar commitment at the time, to the commitment for uh, indigenous owned and operated businesses. That has now exceeded and is now beyond four billion dollars in terms of 
revenues and monies that have been put into and, and given back and participants of the indigenous owned business in actual in the actual mining operations themselves. And I guess I'm also interested in why you haven't been scared off this project when other companies, Norant, Cliffs, have basically, uh, <laughs> you know, they tried to get in and they left uh, figuring uh, there's no hope, this is never going to happen. Yes, it's a great question. It, it is definitely one of the world's most prospective nickel copper PG deposits that are, that's out there today. And I think, that, and I know that that's the attractive part to this deposit. It's going to be a challenging process to get through because it's not just about building a mine through here, it's about meeting the environmental and social governance aspects to it. It's about meeting the level and the hurdles that are established for consensus with the population and consent with the population that's that's in the region. It's about developing and participating in that future economy in a decarbonized environment. And we're in a unique position today with the forecast growth for nickel that Canada can play an excellent position and play uh, a role that's very important to that in terms of the regionalization of supply chains into North America. So we would mine and extract nickel in this environment with some of the greenest energy that's produced. We would then integrate that into a battery electric vehicle market that is North American based and the production of vehicles in North America. You know, we're, we're striving to produce the greenest nickel in Canada with this project. I'm going to tell a little tale out of school here, Stan, in our last minute, which is when I, before we started rolling here, and I was uh, showing you the intro where we say, for the better part of 15 years, the biggest mining prize in the generation, yada, yada, yada. And you said under your breath, we better not be here 15 years from now still talking about this. And my question is, do you think we might be? No, I don't. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity. The ring of fire, I've, I've often said, and, and, and this is where the trillion dollar figure uh, gets bandied around, is basically Sudbury Basin 2.0. And after 140 years of mining in the Sudbury Basin, the trillion dollar figure is fairly apt. We have uh, the ability to basically wipe out unemployment, and I'm assuming there's going to be more mines found. We have the, the ability to uh, basically wipe out unemployment and poverty in uh, the isolated communities uh, throughout Northern Ontario. We're going to be turbocharging the Thunder Bay economy uh, because of the supply and service uh, sector that will be uh, growing in that community. And the kicker is, and, and, and the Premier rightly uh, does use the Ring of Fire as a lure to get that next generation of uh, electric vehicle uh, production in Southern Ontario. That is the second uh, largest industrial sector in Canada after the oil industry. And it is absolutely critical that Ontario and Canada uh, ensure they get their fair share of electric vehicle uh, manufacturing. Well, just to be safe, uh, go into your calendar and mark off the year 2038 and we'll re reconvene here at this table and see how much progress we've made, okay? <laughs> okay, absolutely. Okay, that's a deal. That's Stan Sudall. He is the communications consultant, mining strategist. You can read his stuff on the Republic of Mining website. And on the other side of the table, Kristen Straub, newly minted CEO, Ring of Fire Metals, the subsidiary of Wailu, he's also a geoscientist, and Virginia Heffernan, author, Ring of Fire, High Stakes Mining in a Lowlands Wilderness. She's the principal at GeoPen Communications, and we're grateful to the three of you for joining us here at TVO tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.